Uh, can you have heaven and hell on here on earth as a state of mind uh, and not only in the, in the, upon death? That's a good question. It's absolutely key that we already experience heaven sacramentally. Uh, the, the sacrament of the Eucharist is a sacrament in which we find ourselves together, a community living in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And when we express that which we've experienced in the Eucharist in uh, our ordinary daily life, when you go to your home, for instance, when you think deeply about what's going on there, the love of Christ is being expressed through the normal living out of a family's life. And families are not easy places to live in, as we'll all agree. Or when Mother Teresa goes out from the Eucharist and when she sees the abandoned on the streets of Calcutta and she says, as she used to do, but there is Jesus and these are my brothers and sisters. She's actually living as a citizen of heaven. So that's the first answer. Uh, can we experience heaven on earth? Yes, but sacramentally. And only sacramentally, not yet fully. Mother Teresa is more advanced than we are, maybe than I am. You, you may be more advanced too. Uh, but, uh, so it's very important. If you ask a Christian, what's the next life like? The best thing she or he could do is say, look at the sacraments. It's that life, live fully. Look at the Eucharist. See what's going on there. Uh, people uh, being brought into the life of Christ by the Spirit of Christ, sacramentally already participating in that mystery of divine love, and think of what it would be like if that exploded into the full humankind and the full humanity of humankind was nothing but the expression of that. That's what heaven will be like. Now, your other question about uh, can we experience hell in this world is a far more difficult question to answer. Hell, as I'm trying to say here, is essentially uh, the phenomenon of someone uh, who is so self-deceived, uh, so closed in on themselves, uh, that they cannot open up to the presence of the love of God. They just can't do it. They keep resisting it. They keep, uh, they keep rejecting it. If you like, the love of God keeps getting offered to them, and I don't mean in some theoretical way, but in some practical way. Someone keeps offering them the love of God, and they keep rejecting it. Can we experience that in, in this life? Well, lots of people will say this is hell on earth, as they call it true, and that's more metaphorical, I think. I think we can't experience hell in this life, not in the final sense of it. Because we don't know what God is going to do next. We don't know whether God will find a way through our obstinacy. So I am inclined to think we have to draw back from saying that we can uh, experience hell. But I want to say as absolutely central to what I'm saying tonight, we experience heaven and our citizenship there every time we go to Eucharist and in all the sacraments. And you know, say marriage, for instance. Marriage is a sacrament of the kingdom. Uh, uh, marriage is already a participation in the life of the risen Christ in that particular form. Uh, and so we could go on through, uh, through uh, the sacraments uh, in, in that way. But that would be my answer to you. I'm not sure that we can experience hell. I think hell is far worse than anything we experience. But I am certain that the key Catholic understanding of heaven is that we experience it sacramentally every time in the Eucharist. Yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, is there any way that uh, you can prepare for the devastation of grief? Or must you just go through the wall of fire? Devastation of grief? Well, I'm, I think anyone would tell you you can't. But there is, it's not quite the full truth. Uh, um, we can and do always uh, acts that help us 
to uh, prepare ourselves for a detachment from the things that, uh, that, that we want to cling to. We can prepare ourselves. The whole of Lent, for example, is a little drama in which we try to think of uh, our journey in Christ and we say, well, we'll act out some... You ha Lent has to be physical. You can't do Lent in your head. You have to do something for Lent. And traditionally, they say you do, need to do three things. You need to do acts of mortification, which means I, I give up something. And that give up something is, is only a symbol. It's only by way of saying, I have an awful lot to give up above all my own self-centeredness. And most of it, by the way, most of your self-centeredness is beyond your reach. You know, even with the aid of 24 psychiatrists, you can't get to the bottom of how self-centered you are. Uh, but we give up things and make a symbol of that. Lent is a symbolic little act, it's a symbolic little play. And you do three things with it. First of all, you give up something as a symbol of the giving up that is so much needed and so much more profound than you can do. And in that sense, there is some preparation uh, for death and for grieving. The second thing you do during Lent is you give alms to somebody. Make sure you do this, be it the Vincent de Paul or the person that's hanging around outside Tesco. Give them some alms. And again, it's symbolic. It's not real. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference, you giving your 10 shillings, or is there shillings anymore? There isn't. Anyway, 50p to someone outside of Tesco's. But you're saying in that... I am in solidarity with the poor. I ain't different from them. You're my sister. You're my brother. All you poor, this is my little symbol of saying it to you. It's a play act. It's a play to educate yourself. It's a real physical play. You do have to give away that pound coin. And you don't particularly like doing it, but nonetheless, the meaning of it isn't just the pound coin. It's the symbolic Solidarity. And the third thing you have to do is pray, particularly pray the Eucharist during Lent. So that's a very good question and a tough one to answer. I say you can, but anyone who really grieves know that it still overwhelms you and your preparations fall short. Okay, yeah. Now, Tommy, get the mic over there. <laughs> yeah. Or, sorry, Michael first, yeah. Uh, you used the word there, impervious. Uh, to what extent... Is anybody culpable with regards to rejecting God's love? I mean, I can see it as a development into selfishness uh, with one small decision. Would anybody decide, <clears throat> knowing or aware even, that there may be something here after, deliberately deciding to reject it? You have been living with a lot of nice people, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Try some of the real, well, also be hard on yourself a little bit. We do really, you know, but not perhaps in major ways, most of us. But certainly you meet people in life who would walk all over you for greed. Walk all over you. They become attached to greed and it consumes them. And in doing so, they are rejecting their life as expressing love. Their life is not expressing love, it's expressing greed. And actually, most of the people who run this world are like that. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, think, um, I think we all know that in minor ways we actually do make those decisions, but in major ways, certainly it does happen, and happens an awful lot. Uh, whether somebody finally rejects the love of God, whether God doesn't have a, a, a way of getting through to somebody, even to the most greedy, violent person, and there are many greedy and violent people. Think of wherever, uh, but just think of poor Africa. I mean, we have a half-decent life here now in, in, in Ireland, but two-thirds of the world don't, and that's due to greed and violence. And anyway, but whether, what you can't do is you can't say that God won't find a way through. You simply can't say that. That's not within our compass to say. And that's why ultimately you have to say, hell is this, but I can't tell you that there are people in it. 
By the way, I'm sorry, I'll get to you now, I, sh I shouldn't go on. All those very frightening pictures of hell, you know, uh, devils and sulfur and pitchforks and all that stuff that we grew up with wasn't completely pointless as long as it was used properly. If it is used to, to tell you, hey, this is how bad it can go if you don't open yourself up to the love of God. It's not bad that way because it could frighten you off. What became very bad was when it became a picture of how God acts and then you get the impression that God is someone who loves shoving you into sulfur and burning oil and all this other stuff. The picture was being used wrongly when you get to, uh, to, to that point. Hell is our decision, not God's work. Sorry, Kate. How you doing, Father? I'm on late. Uh, nice listen to you. Um, you talked about love of God there. I have God in my heart, <clears throat> but uh, what I'm struggling with is inner peace. I can't find inner peace for myself. And uh, the fear of death, no, I'm not a fear of death. I know it's a sin, sometimes I wish I was. <clears throat> but uh, I believe in the higher power, you know. It's just the, the inner peace I'm still really struggling with. I have been this past by, you know. Sure, sure. But uh, nice to tell you a bit of understanding, you know. Okay. Thank you. You said the core thing there. You said, I believe in the higher power. You're not ever going to go far off the best way to walk through your life as long as you, you can keep that through. The only thing I'd add to that is, I believe in the higher power who is love. Well done. Yeah. Um, Father Cohen, I'm not sure that this is a question, uh, maybe just a reflection, and it, it, it links in with what Brother Michael said. The older I get, the more inclined I am to think that hell is empty. <laughs> I'm probably a heretic for saying that. You're living with nice people too. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'll tell you why I think that. I think it's because the more I know of myself yeah. and the more I know of the world yeah. and see of the world, the more I realize that life is not a level playing field and that the decisions that we make every day of our lives are shaped by our upbringing, by our education, by our own personal life experiences, um, by how much love we've received or not received. Um, and it's not a level playing field. And I can't conceive of a human being who is so evil. I see many human beings who are evil. I see the evil in myself, but I can't, even if you're talking about Hitler or any other terrible, terrible you know, dictator down through the ages who was responsible for so much, you know, corruption and death and evil. I can't think of anyone who would go through life without being at some stage open to love and open to doing some good. And even if there were, I can't conceive of the love of God having a cutoff point. And if I'm in heaven someday, and no. so to <laughs> I'm not going to be there. <laughs> if I'm in heaven someday, you know, and so totally imbued with this awareness of God's love, I can't imagine I'm going to turn around and say, well, there's Hitler, uh, and I'm just raging that he's here. Do you know, if I'm so caught up in the realization of the God who is love, I don't see anything at all wrong with that, and it's a great tribute to you to be able to think like that. I'd make two comments on it, though. The real purpose of the talk of hell is to remind us that it could happen to us, not to Hitler, but to us. Uh, and the other thing is you should never underestimate how terrible um, things can be done to people and the pain of the victims and the victims uh, uh, don't need... So we've got to be able to listen deeply to the pain of the victims, and sometimes that, uh, that, um, that must allow us to say that there are evil people. 
What you're absolutely right about, Kate, is saying we can't know how God might be able to find a way. We simply cannot know that, and that's where the whole drift of your thought is right. I'm inclined to finish on one more. I was just wondering there about um, if, there were, if there was a battle in heaven and the Prince of Light was thrown out and was put into hell. So there must be a state of a place called hell. There's no doubt about that. But for human beings, for ourselves, I might believe like the caterpillar and the butterfly. For a while, we are sort of always on, on the ground as such. And sin, it's like the transfiguration today. You change, the butterfly sees something different. But it's just, I always wondered about that battle in heaven. If Lucifer was put down to hell. I think sometimes um, people just dismiss this hell, you know. I mean, what you're saying is that we need to take the talk of hell seriously. Uh, I think I would agree with Kate, we do, but we can't say who's there. And it's, uh, it, it's interesting to use the word there. This comes back to my remark about how we can't think without thinking of place. Essentially, heaven is the risen life of Christ. Heaven is the form of human life that life takes in Christ when Christ is filled with the Holy Spirit and sends that Spirit ringing forth upon the whole of humankind. That's what heaven is. Similarly, hell is the rejection of that form of love in a final impervious way and at least we have to say that we should be warned about it but I think we easily too want to be wary of acting as God as regards saying who's in heaven I've been trying quietly in this way to introduce a way of talking about heaven hell and purgatory which actually gets away from place it's almost impossible to do it but at least I'm trying to suggest to you that you, you understand more deeply when you stop thinking place and when you think instead human life filled with the love of God, that's heaven. Now, it's impossible for you to, to stop thinking place. possible for me too. But that's because we imagine place as part of the way we conceive of things. The good thing about thinking about, say, heaven as a place. So heaven is up there and hell is down there. Um, the only way we break the grip of that um, strong imaginative pull is by jokes. So I'm going to end up with a joke. And I'd say if we stayed here all night, you could be telling me even better ones. You might know the story about the very good atheist, very good man, woman maybe. We call him a woman. <laughs> very good atheist woman. She goes and dies and uh, she comes before St. Peter and she says, you know, actually I, I did my best and I helped the poor and so on and so forth, but I never went to church. My whole life I never went to church. I suppose no chance of getting in. And Peter said, not that bother on it. Come on in and I'll show you around. So he shows her many, many big rooms. Notice the way your imagination is going. Many big rooms. And here's, do you see this room here? Whole crowd of agnostics. None of them ever believed in God, but they did good works and they expressed the love of God. So look, and they were all playing harps and whatever else you do in heaven. And he went along to the next room. And uh, uh, you see, this, this woman had been a Catholic in her upbringing. I should have said that. Anyway, the next room was full of Methodists. And it was chock full of Methodists, and they were having a great time. The next was full of Presbyterians, marvelous. And then she came to a big room about this size. And St. Peter says, sorry, we can't go in there. And she says to him, why? And St. Peter says, because the Catholics are in there, and they think they're the only bodies here. <laughs> <laughs> so we leave you at that. <laughs> So thank you very much, Father Khan, for your sense of humour, but above all, your wonderful use of language and openness to explore these very terms we use a lot of, sometimes are afraid to think of and explore 
but thank you very much for helping us to explore them tonight. So next week, we invite you to come back again. We have another, believe it or not, Cork man next week as well. We have Father Sean Moore. Do all the geniuses come from Cork? I don't think so, but it just seems to follow in that pattern at the moment. Can't sit out in the presence of down and entering people here. But Father Sean is exploring conscience next week and what the church says to us about conscience. So if you have time.